Foot binding is an ancient Chinese tradition of forced deformity that passed generationally from mother to daughter. The extinction of the practice will be one of the few great success stories of the late Qing dynasty and the Republic of China on the mainland. In this video, we look at how Chinese society, prodded by Christian missionaries and Western-minded reformers, finally stamped out a tradition that survived multiple dynasties and lasted for nearly a thousand years. The first things I want to say about foot binding is that not every woman practiced it, and not every woman practiced it the same way throughout the years. We don't know why or how it started either. There are some records dating back as far as the Han Dynasty 2,800 years ago showing a cultural preference for smaller feet. During the Tang Dynasty of the 7th to 10th centuries, a scholar writes of small feet slaved dancers spreading the practice countrywide. During the Song Dynasty of the 10th century, Prin Prince Li Yu is written to have had a fetish for small feet and made his concubine Yao Niang do a toe dance with bound feet. However, it's started and spread, it was already a well-established practice by the 14th century. Friar Odoric of Pordenon, an Italian who traveled through northern China for three years in the 1300s, wrote, And with the women of great beauty is to have little feet, and for this reason mothers are accustomed as soon as girls are born to them to swathe their feet tightly so that they can never grow in the least. This is a rather dry description of what actually happens. Like I said, the way it's been done differs over the years, most of what we know about foot binding is based on studies of women done during the Republican era of the 20s and 30s. Historical descriptions of the practice were obscured by uh, flowery language and poetic terms like slender, pointed, and shaped like lotus and water chestnuts. It appears that early on, foot binding was mostly done to make the foot pointier and more narrow, shaped like something like today's heels. Later on, they attempted to sh achieve a sort of arched shape. The binding starts before the age of 10, usually between 5 or 7. In the latter form of foot binding, where you try to create an arched shape, binders fold the second through fifth toes underneath the sole, while at the same time bringing the, foot, the front of the foot as close to the heel as possible. This is done through the inhibition of bone growth, the alteration of ligaments and tendons, and changing the direction of angles, not by breaking bones as is sometimes claimed. After binding, the foot is wrapped in bandages and will require washing and rebandaging for the rest of the woman's life. Benefits include sexual fetish and the image of higher status. Drawbacks include pain, disability, deformity, immobility, isolation, open wounds, septicema, arthritis, gangrene, skin infections, possible paralysis, rotten flesh, and a reported 10% death rate in girls undergoing the process. Which sounds like a fair trade to me, right? At its peak, foot binding was prevalent in both the higher and middle classes. Even peasant and servant women would have their feet bound. Though this only applied for cases where farming did not require wet feet, i.e. rice paddies. Wet farming and bound feet will quickly lead to infections. How prevalent was foot binding in Han society? Uh, various estimations of graveyards and historical accounts say about 50% of Han society women. One survey of a small village in 1929 with 1,736 women and 515 families, found that some 99% of women 40 or over had their feet bound. For women 30 years and over, the percentage was 95%. This was 1929, it's not that far long ago. But much like with many things in culture, foot binding has a practice ebbed and flowed throughout the dynasties. The foreign Mongols of the Yuan dynasty advocated for it, the Chinese Ming Dynasty did not really care for it, their palace women did not have their feet bound, but they allowed their subjects to practice it. The Manzhou people of the Qing Dynasty never did it, abhorred the practice, and actively tried to ban it. The Shunzhi Emperor, the third of the dynasty, issued an edict against it in 1645, his second year as ruler. The illustrious Kangxi Emperor tried again in 1662, but after six years he gave up and withdrew the ban. The Manzhou could get the Chinese men to shave their heads, but failed to get the Chinese women to give up uh, binding their feet. But then came the times of Chinese decline. The late 1800s were dark times for China, a time it calls its century of humiliation. The Qing Dynasty's defeat in the 1842 Opium War, and then in the First Sino-Japanese War, opened up a time of reflection, with Chinese society questioning their traditional once inviolable values. 
Western foreigners kicked off what would become the anti-footbinding movement. The movement was driven by Christian missionaries and had many similarities with the abolition movement. The first recorded organization was founded in 1874 in what is today the city of Xiamen. It caught the attention of Chinese reformers, including reformer Kang Youwei, who started one of his own in Guangzhou in 1883. In 1895, Alicia Little, wife of prominent British writer Archibald Little, along with other prominent wives from the West, founded the Natural Foot Society. Not specifically a Christian society, Alicia apparently didn't hold high views of religion, this unaffiliated nature helped the society dodge the issues of infiltration from the West. This organization fo focused on the foot-binding practice, nothing else. They attracted attention from leading Chinese reformers who helped along with their cause. Anti-footbinders took a three-pronged approach to stamping out the practice. First, an education campaign that focused on two main messages. Other countries did not bind their feet of their women, thus by practicing footbinding, China was losing face in the international community. Second, this education emphasized the advantages of natural feet. Organizers would organize large events where people could see raw photos and x-rays of bound feet, and the very name of the association, Tian Zhu Hui, implies that natural feet are essentially better. Third, the movement established and spun off hundreds of grassroots natural societies. And these the society members, uh, they promised that they would not practice foot binding and not allow their sons to marry women with bound feet. This coordinated movement worked in harmony with a cultural openness to new things, and foot binding began to rapidly vanish from society. After the Qing Dynasty's fall, leadership in the movement passed from the Western missionaries to the Chinese themselves. The Republic of China government in 1915 began to hand out fines for violations, and things progressed very rapidly from there. The same village that bound the feet of 99% of its women born in 1889 and 95% in 1899 went to 0% in 1919. The practice did persist through the 1930s in some isolated areas, but that was it. The banning of the cultural footbinding practice is a rare documented success taking place at a time when Chinese society did not have all that much to celebrate. It is estimated that some 2 billion women had their feet bound over the years from 949 to 1950. Footbinding is a tradition that lasted a thousand years. It died out in just 20. It is indisputable that Western missionaries kicked off its abolition, but the speed with which the practice died out shows that it tapped popular feeling. And the fact is, people were long, long ready to move on from this practice, and so they did. Thanks everyone, have a good night.